Welcome back to the Alexander Schmidt Pop Contemplative Conversations 16, and we're back with Mr. Wesley Chance. Mr. Wesley Chance, welcome back. Hey, good to be back. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to have you back. We've been doing a lot of conversing lately, but usually in triumvirates um, right. or triumvirates or tri uh, triandries or something like that. Because, of course, we have Sarah in the one group and Vince in the other. Who knows what he identifies as? Probably a cookie monster or something like that. But so. it seems like today we're really trying to get into the heart of the matter, Mr. West of Chance. Really trying to cut it to the quick. You wanted to talk about Maps of Meaning by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. One of the most controversial intellectual figures on the planet. But I feel like that's not actually why we want to focus on him today. And I think we're, yeah, go on, please. He's also well, he's um he's a contemporary figure and in that respect a little different from things we normally are talking about stuff that it's least is at least like ten or twenty years old, um, but his work that we're going to discuss today the Maps of Meaning book that he released uh, in ninety nine I think uh, you know it's it's kind of pr preliminary to um, the interest in his work that has come about more recently within the last couple of years. So we're, we're doing something a little different in, in the sense that we're talking about somebody who's alive and working now, uh, but then in the sense where we're talking about the part of his work that lies in the past. So right. I think, it fits with our normal, normal I think that practice. I think that's a wonderful statement and also will be sort of a testament to just how long it takes for the pub public to sort of digest the ideas of academia. Yeah seeing that we're about 19 years behind on several issues, including the blank slate, which Steve Pinker in early 2000s talked about. But, um, but I agree with you that what we really seem to like in him is what we like in these older thinkers that we're always talking about anyway, right? John yeah. Piaget, Carl Jung, several philosophers and uh, psychologists from old. Um, we, he seems to be part of a tradition that it goes much deeper and is much more ancient than, um, than just being sort of a blip on the map, some new anomaly. Um, and I'm not saying that in sort of a prophetic way or even necessarily a Homeric chain way so much as we actually really like Carl Jung and we talk about Carl Jung all the time and that's somebody that he's made popular again. And just, yeah, yeah go on. Well, his, uh, part of his project seems to be to, to reconnect uh, people who maybe highly educated and, and in kind of academic spheres, reconnect them with a more everyday experience of, uh, you know, lived experience out in the world. But on the other hand, to connect everyday people with thinkers that they probably didn't get a chance to read during their, their public education or even at college, right? Like he's, he's kind of this, this threshold uh, to thinkers like, like Jung and uh, Solzhenitsyn is another big one he likes to raise, yes. but also like ancient mythology, like the uh, the Mesopotamian myth that he likes to retell and, and things like that. So he, uh, he operates on a number of different levels. It should also be said that he's got a lot of um, clinical experience behind. Um, so he's not just an academic, although he is, you know, a professor and that shows in the way that he speaks, but, but he's also a clinician, right? And he's like actually used this stuff to help people figure out their their particular problems right so. and not, and just to show the sort of stretch a, a person's consciousness can have not only is he familiar with say egyptian and mesopotamian religion but he also on the side besides being a clinical practitioner and a university of toronto after university you know after harvard university professor which means he was at the top of his game and it's funny it should be said, I, I read a New York Times review the other day that disparaged that he only had two books. Hmm. He has 100 scientific articles published. Yeah. So, you know, that person can shove it right up where he thinks uh, gold <laughs> comes from. Um, it's just that's such poor scholarship. I, it's just totally unacceptable. And I mean, so but I it's can't. interesting. Right. It's like that is a fact, right? The, the person, right. The, the writer, like – put something out but then without the context and that seems to be sort of the point of a lot of the the discussion in maps of meaning is like facts by themselves don't mean a whole lot without 
a whole um, constellation of other right. facts and existing interpretations and and the person who's doing the interpreting all of that really really matters a lot when you when you come to to read a great work or deal with a complex issue or you know whatever it might be so that's yeah, right actually yeah illustrious. let's let's lay out two big things right now let's talk about how it is that humans think in terms of constellated patterns which we can call archetypes which are, you know, which even the Greeks knew about. And that is why we had constellations in the sky. And we'll talk about confirmation bias. Then we can talk about how Peterson's project is broadly speaking, very similar to our project, which is, which is understand the fundamental connection between what it means to be a human and what a story is. With the idea emerging, I think that a human is a story and that what sin or error or mistake is, is when you go off story and you divide yourself from the path of the hero. Um, and we'll talk about the seven archetypes, I think, uh, uh, the seven major ones, the dragon of chaos, the bivalent great mother, the bivalent great father and the hero and the adversary and how those are the fundamental categories by which humans perceive. And uh, I think then you'll have to go uh, to whatever it is you have to do because this also has to be a short and sweet uh, <laughs> episode. <laughs> okay, what was the first part I was going to hit because I, I think that's pretty important. Um, uh, I think... We were going to try to say something about human thought. Was that the first of your... Ah, uh, constellated patterns. Okay, so okay. so what the confirmation bias is, is based on the work, well, not just the work of Ray Kurzweil, understanding that our brains are basically pattern recognition machines, but also several important neuroscientists from both Ru Russia, like L Ligur or Luria and uh, Sokolov, um, mm -hmm. as well as people like Jacques Pingsev. And it just... So how humans see things... In, and this is part of the idea behind the Trinity is we see patterns as they emerge. We, we see this thing happened, this thing happened, boom, we know you're an angry person. Or like you yelled here, you yelled there. At first it was nothing, then it was maybe something, and then you yelled again, ooh, I think you're angry. Um, and that's an okay example. But basically what starts to happen is that as a pattern emerges, we look for more and more evidence of that pattern's existence because we know it does exist so that's what we are focused on because we have selective attention. In fact, we can only keep like three or four variables in our head at a, mo uh, at a time. And Peterson, even in his book, talks about how when you're sitting down and reading, the theater of your consciousness is like your lamp, maybe your phone, your book, and that's everything. And if you think about it, that's, that's how every situation with you is. And that's why uh, first-person video games work. Um, so what a confirmation bias is, is that since you have selective attention, you focus your attention on the things you already know to be real, the known, the patterns that you know exist. But what that leaves you open to is the infinitudes of the unknown. And so as you start to fill your mind, your crystallized intelligence, as you start to lose your fluid intelligence, as you lose your physical, um, uh, your, your physiological capabilities, uh, as you age, uh, your IQ goes down. And so you become, you become more associated with what you already know and less capable of producing new knowledge. And so it becomes harder and harder for you to accept the fact that you do not know everything that you need to know, which makes you less and less receptive to anomalous information, which makes you more and more capable. It makes you more and more brittle, essentially, and less and less capable of listening to others. And I suppose if we connected that to the political right now, I would say that that's the tremendous problem, right? That well, people on both sides. So much, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's like there's so much information and yeah, we haven't gained any uh, huge leaps and bounds in our ability to process that as individuals, right? But we have this incredible ability to access all of it at any time. So yeah, we're like awash in lots of stuff and we have very little um, judgment, you know, like how to, how to organize it all. And so we're kind of at the, at the whim of whatever, uh, prejudices and and groups and things around us tell us is the important stuff right the the thing that's worth listening to and and what you need to do is like jettison all the rest that that seems to be a pretty good encapsulation um at a at a pretty like low level of resolution at least like what is the problem <laughs> with, with political discourse right there's just too much being said on all sides well, there are a couple things, too. I, I think the lie. Also, Peterson makes a big deal and maps a meaning about the lie and then mm -hmm. quotes Solzhenitsyn to quite some extent, just, you know, several annoying pages of quoting as much as good as Solzhenitsyn <laughs> is. 
Jung also was known for doing long quotes like that and also extensive footnotes, highly annoying, but I suppose I let them get away with it because I held them in such affection, though as a reader, I don't appreciate it. But in any case, Solonitsyn talks about how finally at the heart, in his heart of hearts, he realized that he was the problem for the gulag. He was at fault, that the line between good and evil ran down his heart and that what had gotten him there was the infinitude of lies he had told himself and to others and that that had been magnified on a tremendous social scale, that the people got became okay with lying to each other and things started to fall apart. Hmm. And it's funny because it seems almost childish saying that sort of thing. And it's funny, I've often told people about the value of telling the truth and not lying because I think most people don't understand that what they're doing when they lie is they're altering another person's map of reality um, and replacing something that is real with something that is false and imaginary, which means that they're placing a pothole or a small crack that you can trip over in how you perceive things. And I think, I think if you really think that through, that is as bad as it seems. Um, um, and, and so I don't consider that simply a childish lesson, nor do I consider that sort of, it seems like the prevailing mythos or ethos now for us is you should be honest as a kid, but then when you get to the adult world, you're not supposed to be honest anymore because that's mm. expected. Um, and that speaking truth and which I take to mean saying what you see or feel in a given situation so actually reporting what's there um, seems to be like considered a faux pas. Like it's mm -hmm. too hot to touch. Like we can't be honest with each other anymore, which strikes me as the exact opposite of what successful anybody does. A coach and a player, they have to be honest. A husband and a wife, they have to be honest. A teacher and a student, they have to be honest. A doctor and a patient, they have to be honest. If you're going to work with each other. You have to be really honest about what's happening. And I feel like that's one of his fundamental messages. And I don't understand what the problem is with that really at all. Yeah, I, I guess, again, it comes back to this idea, which is, uh, I, I don't know, useful or at any rate um, popular that there's, that there's only competing um, ah. perspectives and not, and not such a thing, right? This is the more sophisticated notion that there's not such a thing as uh, a truth um, outside of your own like sense of it or something. So, okay. Can we, can we address that for a second? Because something that Sam Harris seems to not have, I don't know the perspective for, I don't know for, but maybe that's the truth. Um, and several of the new atheists is that they believe that articulated language is the only key to truth. Hmm. And so the, and this is very much like one of our friends from graduate school who thought that truth could only be, uh, syllogistically conveyed uh, you know, uh, propositions, right? The truth was simply propositional. But we know, widely speaking, of the theory of different memory systems, which Peterson quotes uh, and gives a good outline of, that first you have embodied memory, procedural, things you just know how to do, like throw a ball or kick a ball, that would be very hard to explain, which you learn the second you become a coach, which you are. Maybe you can give some insight into that. Then you have episodic memory, or representational memory, which are, which is your ability to imagine, to to create images in your mind, and then you have uh, articulated um, uh, uh, memories. You have uh, which are totally left brain, the the ones that you can actually put into words, which are the most abstract uh, symbols that have ever that have ever existed, uh, essentially, and thus you understand that a metaphor and a simile is a mixture of articulation and or the articulated system and the representational system and that's what makes it beautiful and so there's the definition of poetry that's the most exact that's ever been given but um <clears throat> hmm. so so i'm sorry sorry that bit of arrogance always gets me off uh there's there's a lie right there no, just but probably not um but we know now that there are truths that you can know without being able to convey your knowledge to somebody else because of your lack of ability to declare what you say. It's the declarative memory system, rather. And so 
you can like say be a winner like Michael Jordan, but then not be a very good coach because you don't know how to articulate what it is to win. You can also, I mean, you, there are things that you know how to do that you cannot speak that does not make those behaviors less successful if being successful in the world is the measure of truth. And I don't see any better measure for truth. And you can call me an American pragmatist or a neo-pragmatist because, of course, we're the ones alive now and we're the ones doing the majority of the thinking and thus we are the crown jewels of this civilization because it can support thinkers of the highest caliber. And that is always indication of the superiority of a culture of a people and the height of a culture of a people. And so Europe, watch out. We're going to win at everything. <laughs> there are things you can know how to do without being able to speak them. And so there are truths that you can be recognizing through your behavior that you can totally disagree with, with your words. And so Peterson says, this is one of the real, real, real dangers of how sophisticated we've become. Because now we have all these people who claim to be socialists who went and paid exorbitant amounts of money for great luxuries like university and all the luxuries that come with university education. And now, and now spend their time criticizing the the structure of the civilization that provided for their opportunity to become educated enough to criticize that civilization without understanding that they are sawing off the branch that they exist on. Because of course, the civilization that supports you, its direct connection to you is that it governs your emotions. And so insofar as it's stable, so are your emotions stable. If, say, these would-be socialists who are really just revent resentful and whiny kids which is a non-gendered term, so I guess that's correct. What they're attempting to do is dysregulate everybody's emotions and to destroy what exists because they don't find themselves in their place at, on the dominance hierarchy that they think they should be. It's a very Cain and Abel sort of story to me, very Lucifer, Jesus. Because what they should be doing, and what I think we're doing by reading Maps of Meaning, looking at all these different stories from the West, the East, across media with different people from across the country, is develop the logos. That's how you get real diversity. That's how you get real differentiated individuals rather than just one amorphous protean mass that's always trying to learn the opinions of others without learning the nature of reality, which is the purpose of an information gathering creature like a human, which is why we eat apples and use Apple computers. Think about that one. Uh, and I can explain that one later, but we don't have time for that. Um, <laughs> And that is some, that's just something funny about talking to you, Wes. Uh, I was so tired before this. I, I burned 1,275 calories, according to my Fitbit, um, in the scorching La Jolla Sun, playing Ultimate Frisbee before this. And all of a sudden, I'm so amped up. I did have some coffee, which helped. But <laughs> there's something about exchange of information and use of logos that is revitalizing. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And I, don't, and I know this is going to sound very esoteric, but... You know, this is me speaking and not Jordan B. Peterson. But it just seems like Aristotle is right. Energeia or intelikeia, an activity that is perfectly in line with your purpose, which for humans is always the exchange of information, which builds trust and uh, broadens the respective domains of competence of each participant. It feels great. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Peterson has evidence for this. Rats in a social group, Hard to get them addicted to cocaine. Isolated rats, very easy to get them addicted to cocaine. And I wonder to what extent one's ideology and the pot shots one takes at people at different, on different sides, because people are lonely, is the little dopamine, cocaine-like stimulation that people are looking for. Perhaps our generation is so lonely that they have to use their ideology as a weapon against others in order to feel good, right? You get on Facebook. I think... Nazis are bad. 17 likes. Mmm, mm. that feels good. But it's like, what have you said? Like, so, something that every fourth grader agrees with? Like, everybody knows genocide is terrible. Nobody, nobody wants that. And of course, someone will pipe up, what about the white nationalists? What about, you know, ISIS? It's like, okay, yes, there are examples, but it's widely agreed that those people are incorrect. I mean, the second somebody's called a white nationalist, they're out of the political game, right? Like, they're, they're totally ostracized. So that seems rather handled to me. Um, it doesn't seem like it's... I, yeah, in any case, I'm not supporting that sort of thing, but I also don't see that as a very big deal. I don't see many candidates coming 
who are like that. And someone will be like, wow, Trump is. It's like, okay, whatever. You know, that, I like that, that I think is precisely the problem. Go on. I like, I like that, that voice that comes out. I don't know. <laughs> being back at school that you're um, getting more, uh, what, more disagreeing voices to, to battle up against and um, to sharpen yourself against. But yeah, I, I can, I can see the, uh, the element of being, well, needing some kind of stimulation from gaining information and then from sharing information in turn, like that does seem to be something interesting about the, the popularity that Peterson has achieved recently, that he's, he's found a way to, to tap into exactly that um, and using the technology that, um, that makes communication so, so easy, right, for anybody nowadays. Um, it, his, his text is, is a lot harder to get into. Um, it requires a little more effort and sustained attention, um, but he seems to have thought up an answer to that too in that he, he went ahead and released a new audio version of it that he read out loud himself. So you've got the kind of combination of these two things, his, his scholarly research and like synthesis of, of tons of work that he did 20 years ago, and then combined it with his spoken and outspoken um, persona, which is so magnetic and charismatic now that has become so popular. He sort of combined those two things. And I haven't actually listened to the audio version of it yet, but he's got some excerpts that are freely available and you can, you can find those easily. But, um, but I know you've listened to most, if not all of the, the audio book. I was curious if there were any significant differences in the experience of, of reading it versus listening to it, or um, if, the, if, it, if one was more accessible or I don't know, just any, any thoughts. All right. That? Yeah, I have several. Um, thank you for asking. Yeah. I finished the audio book recently. It takes about 30 hours to get through. So it's intense listening. Yeah. Also, I, I recently restarted to go through some of the neurobiology to get more solid on that. And something I always do with Peterson. So as not to be sort of an acolyte because that's not, you know, who is the Buddha's master. That's not what we're doing here. I, I always check up on him and I read the people that he cites, people like Ray Kurzweil, Carl Rogers, uh, E.O. Wilson, um, uh, Warren Farrell, Eric Neumann, Carl Jung, E.M. Sokolov, uh, Franz DeWall, Lynn Isabel. You know, the list goes on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Camille Paglia, people that have entered my life that I never knew about because of him. And so I'm, I'm not simply party line. I'm, I, I think I'm approaching agreeing or disagreeing with anything he says in the most scholarly possible way by reading his bibliography rather than saying that which I think people will agree with who I already like and know will agree with me. Um, mm -hmm. But watch, listening to it, it wasn't, it's not as easy as I thought it would be. So he makes the claim, and I think it's true, that um, people, people listen better than they read. It's much more sophisticated and more difficult to read than it is to listen, and that's true. But there's a big difference between reading a book out loud and giving a lecture. Yeah. Because there are cues in the lecture. And I know this as a lecturer, and I'm sure you know this as a lecturer too. Your lectures are made for listeners. And they're very good. And they're very interesting. And his are very good and very interesting. Though I, I think he's gotten somewhat tired and bored, boring on his uh, 12 Rules for Life one because he's just saying the same thing over and over. And he's distilling it down. And it's like, okay, go read some new books, please. I want some new examples from you. Um, <laughs> But um, it's still hard. It's still hard listening, just like it's hard reading. It is easier to listen, though. And he does sound good, but it, it's, he doesn't have the same impact he does when he lectures. He's not screaming or, like, <laughs> shaking his hands in, in your face and uh, getting all excited about things. The kind of things you, like, really look for when you're, you know, listening to a lecture. The kind of things you hope for that make uh, an experience interesting. Um, that said, it's very useful to be able to go back 30 seconds and to just focus on specific chapters and just listen to them over and over and over and over. It's something I've started to learn now that I've taught through you know, the Iliad something like 10 times and the Odyssey 10 times is that the more times you go through doing something, the more you fill in the small gaps that you've always left and the better you get 
at these things, the clearer your knowledge becomes, the closer you come to Socrates' hundred-parted, or knowledge of Socrates' hundred-parted wagon, rather than the unsophisticated four-part that most people have, showing that even Plato understood uh, the difference between a skilled craftsman and, you know, essentially a sophist or somebody who, who was not skilled. That the truly skilled person, like Aristotle, also would agree with Plato because they, like Ernst Cassirer said, broadly do agree. And you can look for evidence of this in the beginning of the Parmenides, um, uh, and what happens and transpires there before the argument has gotten into. But that, um, and sorry, I'm forgetting my point, making these big claims and trying to slide them under the rug like that. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, well, you started from. I think the the difference between a a person who listens and parrots or ah uh, yes and the competent yeah. man yeah. the master that seems to be what people are now fighting against the idea of mastery and anybody that starts to become a master and shows himself as a master by going into the middle of the stage or hanging from a chandelier this is the meaning of Jordan Peterson's dream by the way for those of you who do want to know humans. As Peterson often says, we are like zebra. How do we camouflage? Well, we don't look like our environments. We don't look wooden. We don't look like green trees or whatever our natural environment would be. We camouflage against each other. And since we're psychic beings, we do this by holding the same opinions as those around us so we can continue to trust each other. So the most dangerous thing a human can do, which is actually which will get you the abstract version of stoning now through people hurling insults at you is step out of line and voice an opinion different from that uh, prevailing in the group, mm -hmm. even if it's true. And this is what a prophet seems to be. Someone who knows they're going to be pilloried, tarred and feathered, uh, you know, stoned for saying what they think is true. And this seems to be the heart of the matter for for Jordan Peterson that, um, and I know I'm, I'm leaving off the first question, but I think this is what, I think this is the money shot. And um, what happens is you have to realize when you step out of the herd, just how vulnerable you are as an individual, that that is the story of the crucified God for Jordan B. Peterson. That in that moment, you see just how subject to the will of, the mass, you are, you're in group, you know, if you're an American like you and I are, to the 350 million other people, and that that is a horrifying experience because you get to see the, you see your protection as the predator for which it really is, and just how quickly it will turn on you if people do not think and realize that you are trying to help them, not trying to hurt them by pointing out their flaws. And I think that is precisely what is so dangerous about this situation with people getting so sensitive and not listening to people who are just trying to help them saying things like clean your room and trust is the fundamental underlying key to society. I mean, even Cicero says that, I mean, uh, Dante says that it's, it's not there. That's everywhere. If you read the ancient literature, the medieval literature, even the modern literature and Milton mm -hmm. and that in order to be a truly good person, I guess the, Peterson would call the truly Christian person, the person of the age of the fish, the fish that people get to feed on, you have to step out of line when you see something. Because the second you see things for how they are and you gain the ability to use the logos, you have to share, or you're Jonah and the whale. Hmm. Or you get eaten up by your own emotions. Because as natural information gatherers, seekers, as Harry Potter would say, and distributors, because of course we physically die, so the information we have access to, we have to distribute into the collective in order for it to be meaningful. Um, that, uh, sorry, I'm losing, I'm losing that last train. Well, it. That that is the you're saying his interpretation essentially of the New Testament story. Uh, yes. Right? Okay. Is that you have to accept that vulnerability? And potentially even having that vulnerability not only exposed, but, but you know, hit. You might get wounded for speaking in that sort of way, but that's the best sort of life. That's, that is aligning your, yourself with the path of the hero against the adversary. Yeah, this is something that comes out a lot. You mentioned Sam Harris, one of his uh, 
not exactly i don't know i mean they debate i guess but they really sort of have these these televised um speaking events together where they lay out some thoughts and react to each other and and those have been interesting for a couple of reasons like they aren't actually supposed to be freely available but people post them to youtube anyway which is interesting for one thing and then the other interesting thing about it is like how resistant um people are to peterson trying to tell them that they deep down believe something that they don't intellectually think that they believe right right his interpretation of christianity is seems to be one that is much more sort of pragmatic and like if you act this way you act as if you believe it therefore yes. you believe it basically right and so they don't seem to like <laughs> that uh that that leap uh particularly uh, be, partly because i guess they've sort of built their whole persona around atheism right that they're staunchly opposed to uh religious belief and and so i think it's pretty interesting how on the one hand peterson is i think i've mentioned this before when he's come up in our discussions like he doesn't come out and say like i'm a christian he tries to point out like how complicated a question that is like what do you mean by that what does god mean to you blah 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 right he says this sort of thing when when he when that question comes up but on the other hand he's very you know quick and i think pretty effective at like disarming his opponents using essentially an appeal to his understanding of christianity right which i find it very interesting i find it cool that that's sort of another way that he has used his popularity is to go and, and read the bible publicly essentially right and like speak about all sorts of crazy and interesting connections that he can find to the the biblical stories um these are things that i find to kind of cut against the claim or maybe assumption that this is like you know a culture that's become secular and relativistic it seems like his popularity and the centrality of new testament imagery and metaphor and and meaning is is showing that that's like just not really true right he's He's I a, totally, I, a, yeah, yeah. yeah so. What he seems to be hitting on, which we are hitting on, I think, and to a lesser extent right now, is the need for the new genius, for the new, the new image that people, that 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 people represent and embody together, that gives meaning and substance to their existences, and that what what he seems to be hitting on is that, yes, we figured out that. The Bible was written in sort of a poetic language, not a scientific one, not a, the not an incredible claim. We've only had science for like 400 or 500 years, or like since the 17th century. So obviously the Bible was written in a pre-scientific time or pre-scientific people who lived in a world of meaning rather than objective facts, understanding that their feelings and thus their experiences were reality for them in an existentialist sort of way. And so what we need now, because we are gotten smart, but not smart enough. We're very sophomoric, mm -hmm. like we've been talking about in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, is we're like, oh, those aren't scientific facts. It's like, A, you're not a scientist and don't even understand how to conduct science. And you <laughs> are subject to the confirmation bias all the time. B, you've obviously never been to a decent literature class that's taught you how to understand symbols, which is, of course, what you're naturally doing whenever you use language. Think about it for five seconds. All right. Uh, and it's like, <laughs> so in any case, what we need now is to understand what these symbols meant because they indicate archetypal or fundamental emotional situations. Usually, some confounding anomaly wrecks us. We're in a dark wood. We're lost. We've killed a man. We have a sign upon our head. Babel, a tower, has just fallen and no one understand each other, understand each, uh, understands each other. I've just, uh, or, or there's a flood that's just now coming, or now we're enslaved, or our brothers have betrayed us. These are anomalous situations that make you have to use the logos because you don't know what to do because you're thrust into unknown territory. And what he seems to be saying, which is not only what the Bible is saying, but because I'm a master of the five epics, I can say each and every one of them says, Paradise Lost, The Divine Comedy, uh, The Iliad, The Odyssey, and The Aeneid. And I'm putting up those lectures, I swear to God, Wes, I'm not giving up on that project. That's fine. Each and every one of them talk about the fundamental archetypes 
that, or the fundamental way that humans see reality, which Peterson talks about, which is there is the knower, the individual, and the unknown and the known. And what these ancient stories say is that you're going to get thrust in the unknown all the time because we can't possibly know everything. And that's what all of our space epics say as well, and all of our voyage epics. And every time we go to the underworld, that's what that's all saying. You get thrust into the unknown. And in the unknown, which is unprocessed information, which can cause trauma if you do not process it, which is part of what PTSD is, right. you have to process that information because that is the gem of the unknown, and that is what you were chosen for as an information processing unit or as an individual within the species. You have to interpret it yourself, and that's the great heroic endeavor. Can you interpret your own experiences and then share them with people? Because if they had had the same experiences as you, it would have felt the exact same because we're isomorphic. Yeah. And, that, and that sounds like, I don't know, something that would make me feel more connected to my fellow man. True Eros. If I truly realized that my suffering was his suffering mm -hmm. and that by being able to articulate my suffering to him, I would help to ease his suffering and that that's sometimes all you need to do, which is why all these help groups have people sit in a circle and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. It's like, it seems like we're doing the opposite of that when we're just yelling at each other and not listening because all we need to do is talk and then we, <laughs> we feel better all the time. Yeah. Which I think is a, yeah, go on. Well, no, it's just, um, I mean, that seems to be, right, the, if you consider like him as a therapist and his audience as, the person who's got a problem that they don't quite understand, ah. right? He, he always sort of deals with, he sort of comes back to the same issues. Um, and they do seem to be those archetypal, you know, problems, difficulties that have to do with the nature of, of a person. But it's interesting to think about it in the sense of like the, the society itself needing that uh, healing communication right like that in that sense it's it's less like a prophet who, who does you know this the thing you were describing earlier right like state state something and becomes martyred for it or, or whatever mm -hmm. but more like um like a physician or um yes. you know a, he he tries to distance himself from politics and i i can see the the usefulness of that but but it is it is in a way a kind of clinical like elaboration of something that has been repressed almost right like this right belief that has been uh you know intellectualized out of existence but remains in practice he's sort of like right. laying, laying that bare and letting people hear it and like recognize it and then start to put the pieces together yeah that seems that seems exactly right like he's a metaphor he uses is burning away the dead wood and some people are most dead wood mostly made of lies and false conceptions and i suppose we could close with the story of donkey i think i've told you the story of donkey before that i heard once at kittredge magnet school for high achievers as a fourth grader during one of our many multicultural sorts of uh stage events it was a wonderful story by a wonderful african man i don't remember the country of which because i was a young person and that's how i originally saw him yeah. and so i listened to his story though and maybe that's what's important but this is what he said, and maybe look, and, I, and I'll say in conjunction with this, I recently started mountain biking again, just to realize, even though I thought I was good at mountain biking, I hadn't biked in 17 years, and I had never really mountain biked, even though in my head, I thought I was just fine. And so at the beginning of time, all animals existed in the same form, and they could choose to be whatever they wanted, and then they would become that sort of animal. And so those that like to fly became birds and those that like to swim became fish and those that like to be strong became lions. But the greatest of all animals that could do all things better than any of them, much like Achilleus from the Iliad, was donkey. Yes, the mighty donkey could fly higher than the birds, swim deeper than the fish, and roar louder than the lions. And because of his great prowess, man came to donkey and offered him money for his services. Just plow my fields, man said to donkey. Eight hours a day, and I will keep you fat and fed for all time. This seemed like a good deal to donkey. To be taken care of, just for work? 
and he could practice roaring and flying and swimming in his head. Imagining is just as good, really. And so he did this for many years, over and over and over. And every day he would be too tired truly to practice what he loved, but he would imagine himself flying and swimming and roaring. And one day a lion showed up where Donkey was working. And he made the mistake of roaring at Donkey, not knowing the fearsome beast that he had disturbed. And so Donkey filled up his lungs with air. And he huffed and he puffed and he let out a mighty hee-haw. And the lion saw what had become of Donkey and he pitied him. For though all animals had become precisely what they were, Donkey alone had become nothing at all. I wonder if that story isn't the story of what Peterson and what you and me are trying to combat. That perhaps we can't have everything in this world, but we can have something if we want it and we target it and we, ain't, and we attempt to achieve it. Right on. Well, this was short but sweet. Perhaps we'll have another chance to talk about it. And I'm glad to be able to talk to you again one-on-one, -on -one, Wes. And I'm looking forward to talking to you a couple times tomorrow if everything works out. Yeah, there is there is much to uh, I mean, didn't even get to 12 rules, which is the new book. I haven't read it yet, but um, and then there's also all of his uh, his his lectures are one thing, but there's also all the classes that he's given on maps of meaning, many of which, if not all of which are like on YouTube at this point. Right. So, yeah, lots of other lots of other stuff out there to kind of dig into, along with the bibliography and the. Uh, the scientific papers and all that good stuff. So yeah, much yeah. more, much more to discuss another day. Right I think on. he has 386 videos on YouTube right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I'd say that of the, I think five versions of maps of meaning he has, uh, I think he has 2015, 16, 17. He has his um, public uh, TV versions. And he also has his Harvard lectures from when he was younger, when he was just building, when he was just writing the book. And he's so intense. It's incredible. <laughs> I, I like the Harvard lectures the most he still has like jet black hair and he has this one kid in there who's pushing him the whole time i love it cool. i love it it's 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 and you know he's just a year older than i am now at that time and so it pushes me you know to get there faster because i think that's the whole idea of one generation into the next yeah get there faster cool all right Sounds well good. thank you again. wes yeah appreciate it talk to you soon till next time bye The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.